Greetings, this is Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. I am on campus here at DePaul University and I am joined by Dwayne Peavy. Dwayne is the Vice President and Director of Athletics here at DePaul. And Dr. Anna Marie Frank, she is an Associate Professor in Kinesiology here at DePaul. Greetings, thanks for joining us here at Athletic Director U. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You've been here for almost a year in this role. You have almost 25 years though in college athletics, so you have a wealth of experience. You, you served at Kentucky with Mitch Barnhart, right? Yes. Overseeing basketball, helping develop, redevelop the basketball program to prominence in terms of what it is now. You were in the deputy role, you were worked in fundraising. Yeah, you had your hands in a little bit of everything during your time there. Of course, you, Dr. Frank, you 28 years here at DePaul, research in kinesiology, in sports, in education, uh, diversity, a number of different things. And of course, you serve as the faculty athletic rep here, the FAR here at DePaul, which is a very influential position, actually very influential position when you think about the what a, uh, the impact that an FAR could have. And I'm, and I'm excited to be here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, leadership, a little bit about you guys' relationship in terms of both relatively new, you really new, but you have, were involved in athletics uh, here on campus. Dwayne, my first question is to you. You've, you've uh, you spent some time in different leadership roles working with elephants in the profession, whether it be basketball coaches, whether it be football coaches, whether it be athletics directors, commissioners, and you come into this role, you're a year in. After a year, um, and some of your staff will probably attest to this, you, you probably believe you are this type of leader, then you have the blind spot and the people that you work with know what type of leader you actually are. Can you tell us like, what kind of leader do you believe you are? And <laughs> do you know what your staff, kind of leader your staff believes you are kind of situation? No, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I would define myself as a servant leader. Uh, I really think about uh, trying to help others grow. Um, I think the reason I'm in this position, the reason I decided I need to be a director of athletics versus my previous role as deputy, because I wanted to help more people in the profession reach those goals, whether they see that in themselves or not. I wanted them to have the opportunity to take that other step. So uh, my focus is making assistant coaches want to be head coaches and, you know, other associate ADs and senior associate ADs have the opportunity to see a pathway to be an athletic director if they so choose to. Um, I would say if, if I ask them what I expect them to say yeah, right, exactly. uh, is that I'm not a micromanager, um, that I give them room to grow. Uh, I probably expect more out of them than maybe they see in themselves. And hopefully they see that I'm willing to get in the weeds with them and get my fingers and nails dirty too. Uh, and that maybe they feel that servant leadership as well. Yeah, excellent. When I, when I have one of your staff on one of my podcasts, we'll be able to confirm okay. that. Right? <laughs> That's good to know. Dr. Frank, you served some time on the, I guess it was called the University Athletics Board here at DePaul. I think you chaired it uh, yeah. for a while. T talk to us a little bit about what that board represents. And, and really now that you are the FAR, how does that tie in uh, to college athletics and its support of the mission for college athletics in general, which is to, which I believe is to enhance the academic mission of a university. The University Athletic Board here is, I think, unique, and Dwayne could uh, confirm that in that we have a, a board of seven faculty, five staff, three um, students, and we come together on a monthly basis to talk about um, athletics. Our mission is to review the policies and to make sure that we there's an outside body or a you know a, a very broad perspective of people looking at the policies and maintaining the integrity of what happens in athletics and i was on the board twice i've chaired it twice over my 28 years here recently um, I was. I actually had one more year as chair, but then the president asked me to be the FAR. So I will maintain my position on the board as an ex officio. So I'll be involved, but I wouldn't be a voting member. And I think that when Dwayne, what's important to me is that when Dwayne came on, he he had to get his head around all these different groups that he had at his at his disposal, and. 
he realized that the University Athletic Board was this, again, this broad perspective of constituents across the campus that could provide him with information and feedback. And I'll never forget the day he said, why wouldn't I bring things to you, information? Why wouldn't I bring things that I want to roll out to the public to you so that I can hear your perspectives? Um, and he, he valued that um, you know, explicitly. And it made everyone on the board feel very valued and respected as well. So I am really happy that maintaining that role, because I think that the we all have the same mission, and that is to enhance and to ensure the quality of life for all of our student athletes, and whether it's educational, physical, mental. And I think that the board, that was their perspective and that their mission and mine too now is FAR. Yeah, understanding that, right? right. Much the, the FAR is the embodiment of enhancing the academic mission of the university through college athletics, right? And so um, you came on here recently in the last month or two. Officially on uh, July 1st. Right, officially. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you had experience with FARs in your previous stops along the way before you got in the chair here at DePaul. Thinking about academics on campus, sometimes the faculty is not necessarily the biggest fan of the athletics department and college athletics. And so I wonder about your process in, in making sure that academics is well entrenched in athletics here at DePaul when you took over the chair a year ago and how that has evolved, and especially now that she's the FAR. Well, I think the FAR role is unique because um, you're so more intertwined in the athletics department and knowing the ongoings of what's going on at other schools, the conference level as well. Um, that's been something that's probably an easier transition, you know, whether it was Joe Fink when I was at Kentucky or John McEnroe when I first got here or now with Annie. Um, I know they understand it and get what I, the challenge that's on this side, not just what it looks like from the outside of it. But um, as uh, Annie's point about the the athletics board was a unique opportunity for me. I started a job in a pandemic. Uh, I wasn't going to see a lot of face-to-face um, faculty or, you know, having a good or bad, you know, talk to a lot of our faculty members. And so here I saw an opportunity. I have seven faculty members that right. monthly would like to hear about what's going on, be involved, actually want to help me. And so I looked at it more from that side of it. Obviously, I understand what the perceptions are. I mean, they've got perceptions of me and what we do every day, just like folks in athletics have the perception of what faculty are thinking about. So really opening it up at an opportunity when we really get to vet through things. And I saw that role is how, you know, like Dr. Frank said, when I'm going to roll out things publicly every day, why wouldn't I be proud enough to talk to actual faculty members that are interested in helping me tone that? You know, I'd rather hear those things now from internal groups, make edits, changes. They can be a part of the process, but we took it a step further. We actually used our group to help us come up with different things that we were doing too, not just be the ones to check and sign off on it. I think that's underutilizing a group that puts that much time and effort. I know on our end, anything that you're going to meet, you know, eight, nine times a year in, you don't want it to be you just show up and I got to hear a presentation and then I move on because your colleagues, when something's going on in athletics, they come right to you because they assume you know more than me. And so I want them to be a part of the process so that they can talk openly about it, not just, yeah, I got a heads up on this. I knew about it to know the background of how it was built and the decision making. We don't always have to agree, but why wouldn't I want to at least show our side of it, explain the process? And then we also walk out of there knowing uh, what the situation is before it's a public um, public thing or campus wide. Yeah, you didn't want to just bring them a decision that had been made already, right? You right. wanted them to be included in the decision. And, and, and from what I understand, you've included much of the faculty and academic community in the strategic plan that you wrote out here recently. Uh, and I guess that's an embodiment of what you just explained, right? right? Um, t- talk about that and are they, I mean, everybody's busy and everybody has a lot to do, but were they excited to be included in that? I mean, you talk about a strategic plan for athletics and where we want to go. You're a think big, think long person. And, and so talk to me about their, uh, you know, how excited, well, how involved did they actually want to be and were they 
excited to be involved. Tell me about that part. Well, Annie might can share more about how they felt about it, but I would tell you with a goal. Um, I know coming in here and where we were as, as a university a year ago and looking into this job from day one, you know, Annie was on the, the search committee. And so I knew she was one person that knew exactly what I was talking about, what I was trying to bring to the table. Uh, but a lot of people didn't know that. And so I thought it was important early on to show, OK, to reemphasize what athletics role is and how does it fit into the university? Just like you talked about earlier, don't make assumptions. Uh, I felt like we needed to be a better front porch to our university. Um, no matter what, whether you like sports or not, it is something that's externally out there enough, has the outreach that sometimes maybe some of our 10 colleges don't. And we've got to be a better represent representative of our university. And how do we make every part of our university greater? So you can take one approach. We could be the 11th college, so to speak. And there's a lot of eyeballs on us. Um, but that comes with a lot of responsibility. And I was really getting ahead of asking or what we're going to be to create that big picture to let people know that it's an investment in athletics. So we have to give you a return on that investment for you really to understand our role in the bigger picture of the university. You know, I spend a lot of time meeting one on one with deans now because I, without any topic and those conversations have been great because, you know, I don't know what their history has been. I can't count on that. The way I look at it, there's a pre-pandemic mode and there's post-pandemic mode. And everything matters even more now in higher education because of the trend, um, the you know, decline in net tuition revenue. And so we have a bigger role to play. And maybe athletics is a thing that can help buck the trend. And, and so I'm, my first question when I meet each of our deans is, how can athletics help you? How can we help you? And there might be some things and some ideas that we can collaborate on. But it hasn't been as much of their excitement because I know if I'm trying every day to make our university greater, better, we all benefit. And that's just been our goal and, and what we see as our role in athletics. All right. Dr. Frank, you, you know, guy comes in and he's a he's a I want you to think 15 years where, where we want to be 15 years from now. I know what we need to be successful tomorrow. or You can tell me what we need, but what else do we need to be successful? Five and 10. He's a big, big idea, big dreamer. Tell me about that. He comes in and meets with the board and includes faculty in uh, strategic planning and some of the things you're doing with student athletes. T talk to me about the, how that reception was amongst the faculty. Well, the board welcomed him with Flank because of his, um, in his focus on transparency and involvement and collaboration. And that's something that sitting on the board, you want to be involved in it. You really want to give as much. You want to help as much as possible. So it, the tone was was ideal when um, we talked about that. The vision, uh, you know, like we're talking about a five-year strategic plan is what we had. Um, it was an it was an excellent marriage between work that was that needed to be done behind the scenes and what was happening here, you know, historically and currently, and then where do we want to go, and then bringing in our perspective. So there was enough information given to us, um, a shell, if you will, and then we got to uh, provide a lot of input, and the board was extremely happy to be involved in that process. And then the strategic plan was then, you know, needed and and baked and you know taken apart and and then sent to other constituents. So I think the process was ideal. And again, we were very very excited to be involved in it. Um, one of the things that came out of that, I think, uh, to talk about specifics, is the involvement of the um, the videotaping by one of our faculty on the board works in. Um, I'm not even sure what his role is, but his students now can come in and provide videotaping for athletics. Follow teams or something like that, right? I think I heard about Where that. Well, we didn't have the funds to do that right. previously. So just um, having us work together is beneficial, on, you know, from all perspectives. Right. It works. Now, you come in, you take over for a legend, all right? She, how long was uh, Jean here? I mean, 45 years, 18 plus as athletic director. Yeah, there were big shoes to feel. <laughs> I interviewed her <laughs> once and I asked, I said, you know, the, the, the student athletes that you were probably mentoring when you came on the first five or 10 years are now probably people you are 
trying to tell them about the upgrades we want to make to facilities or something along those lines. And so I thought that was interesting. Um, tell me about that. You come in and, and you know, I worked a long time with football coaches and, and a new coach would come on and they always say, well, we got to get some kids here. Right. And I'm like, I mean, it, there's some quality guys here already. You know, you just want to bring them in and fit your system or whatever. So so coming here. I mean, all you can do is just make things better from wherever they were, right? Whether they're right. good or great, you still want to make things better or they wouldn't, you know, they would have just left things as they were, you know, she retired. So talk to me a, bit, a little bit about that, coming in and looking at everything, assessing things, following someone who's been here for a while and left a good impression. And uh, now you got to take it and make it your show. Well, I think it was a unique opportunity. I think that was the great thing about it is that, you know, you have someone that's retiring versus some controversy or something happening because, you know, the job's open for a reason. You really hope that it's a better situation when you have someone moving on because they leave a better product. Uh, so that's why it was such a unique opportunity for me. Uh, that's why I was willing to take a job in a pandemic and while I was a year into grad school because the Paul type job doesn't just come open all the time in that situation. But I think I wanted to assess everything. Um, you know, like you said before, I'm a big picture thinker. Uh, I looked at the staff like a hundred times over, whether it was their credentials, their bios, their pictures. Um, you know, how and I'm not a true servant leader if I'm not willing to take my team, uh, try to get the best out of everyone there. Obviously, it's about the unit to some degree. And so maybe there's some outliers that you got to change just to make sure it doesn't affect the whole team. But I went into that process of not knowing what some of our, my counterparts have done at certain schools where day one come in with five new faces and six people are gone. Um, you know, I, I challenged them. Um, and then a lot of people that maybe before I got the job, before I knew them, that I thought, OK, it's probably it's going to be a tougher road because based on what they've done. Um, but I don't know what they were asked to do. I don't know. You know, they you know, I'm a more of an external side person. I told Jeannie one of the first times we met that you should have hired me as deputy AD. We've been a hell of a combination because of just our thought processes and what we brought to the table. And I, you know, even at our press conference, I explained it as more of a relay race and that I'm taking the baton from her. And I'm that anchor leg and I'm trying to get us to a world record step. So taking it to where we haven't gone before, but somebody had to finish it. And I took that approach into everything we're doing here. So we've made minimal changes. We've added to our team. But I think it's about motivating each individual, learning that in a year's time. It takes time to learn, you know, what, you know, everybody's got to be, you know, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, Jimmy Johnson, that everybody's got to be coached a different way. I had to learn what makes them tick, you know, what motivates them. And it's not the same for everybody. There's a bunch of people I can get in the room and I say, hey, we're going to go after it. And they're just charging ahead. Some people are more hesitant. I think that's the thing that took some time because we weren't face to face during this. But we have great people. Uh, the human capital here at DePaul is one of the assets we have. And so I'm not doing my job if I just thought we just need to change to make change. And that's allowed us to care for not just Jean's legacy, what she's done in this program, um, from the student athlete development standpoint, uh, for women leaders in, in college athletics, you know, the capital projects and things of this nature. Now, I can't let that be wasted time. It's how do we capitalize and move forward at a unique time for DePaul, because coming out of this pandemic, how do we resonate with everybody? What's going on? And that's why the time is now. And it's probably why we really focus early on our strategic plan. You know, it's long term, but it gave us a guideline of the things we do every day, guiding principles of why we do what we do. And it's very interesting. And he'll tell you the five guiding principles that I brought into our interview process, just looking into what DePaul needed. It says a lot about this place that the staff unified around those same goals. And that's what we use today. That wasn't my plan. It was ours. And that said a lot about the connection and the fit, that we all had the same goals and thoughts and how to get there. We just hadn't put it, the plan out in front of us. Yeah, which is excellent. I mm -hmm. wonder, Dr. Frank, um, and, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, university athletic board to faculty athletic rep, there's a I think there might be a bigger education process in terms of FAR because now you're a national role yeah. kind of situation. Tell me about your education process in terms of, because there's a lot to know before the last 18 months and there's a lot to know over the last 18 months and then go, moving forward, there's, there's a whole lot to consume in terms of understanding 
the full college athletics realm. Talk to me a little bit about your, and your associate professor here, so I imagine you probably consume a lot of information already, read and educate yourself a lot. But what is your process of, or what will be your process of staying educated on? Well, NCAA first, and... um, Dr. McEnroe, I knew him and we worked together on the board for years. And so he um, informed me of a lot of the you know, logistical issues of it. And he introduced me to the Big East Conference uh, moderator um, early on. And I, so I was getting emails and reading all those emails. And so you get a lot of information through emails and um, reading social media and things like that. You know, you get introduced to all that. So it, I have felt the need to, you know, do more reading, get more involved. You know, I have the NCAA manual now on my computer. Um, you know, I've looked at the, F, um, trying to read on the NCA website, FAR, um, not a lot there because it, they disseminate the responsibilities to each institution. So then, and I was given the responsibilities in writing and I have those and I've looked over those. And so going down the list and thinking, okay, how am I gonna do that? And how am I gonna do this? Um, like you say, reading a lot. I mean, all the, um, one of the things that we've changed is that I get every press release now that comes out of the uh, athletic department. I didn't get those in the past. And so reading all those and just being informed. Again, it's been a little bit over a month officially, but um, I think just being involved and, you know, and Dwayne has been excellent at that. We have, um, and I wasn't sure if it was Dwayne's initiative or if it was um, athletic academic advising, but we now I have a committee and it's the student athlete experience committee. And we don't know what our name is, but we met three times, I think. Um, and I'm part of it. Again, athletic academic advising um, is a big part of it. And then the athletic administration. And we're all working together to enhance this, the experience of the student athlete. Mm -hmm. Academics, you know, I know mental health is gonna be a big issue, you know, again, continued physical health. And so I'm being brought in to be a part of where I'm needed. And that I think is, you know, a, will help with the educational process. Like I know what AAA does because I've been involved in the athletic board, but what are the real intricacies and then how can we enhance that? Um, I'm looking forward to finding out a lot more about what's happening at other institutions. I you know I haven't done any of that. We didn't have a, we had a Big East meeting, but that was really about uh, awards and that, but going to NCA meetings and talking to my colleagues. So I'm looking forward to that and finding out what's happening there and sharing what we're doing here. Yeah. You know, it, I don't anticipate being FAR here is gonna be a real difficult situation. <laughs> it's gonna be exciting and it's gonna be work that I'm gonna love, but academic excellence, you know, it, you know, it, to me, it's we're second to none when it comes to academic excellence, and our awards speak for themselves. So, just being part of the process and how someone from the outside with my background can help and bring uh, a valuable perspective and a respected perspective. Um, I feel very respected by the staff here, um, and just how I can help, and that's I think. Um, you know, you talked about the educational process, but I think it's, you know, just wherever I can learn and be part of the process is going to be right. my biggest focus. Which is important. Um, I heard you on a previous interview on athletic director, you, you and a couple other deputies, two of which now are athletic directors. I think all three said one of the most important things when you look for an ideal job in a chair is the relationship with the president. Tell me about that. Tell me it's been a year and tell me about your relationship with the president. Yeah, I think it's, it's when you're looking at a position, um, you want to see someone that can have that same vision or give you the opportunity for the growth. The same thing I'm trying to provide for my staff or those constituents um, tied in to the bigger mission of what the school is. Uh, I wasn't really looking for somebody that, okay, I know they care about athletics and they're just going to let me do whatever I want to do. I mean, I wanted somebody that I could admire and learn from as well to be a better leader um, that could help me grow. And in a short period of time, what I found out is as I progressed to be on our president's cabinet, I was surrounded by those type of leaders that I could learn from. You know, here I was the first time in this chair, um, but I could work with a group, you know, just like Dr. Frank here 
people that have been in the higher positions and been heads of committees and had a lot of responsibility. Um, I look at, I have a ton of mentors now on this campus. They might not understand that that's the role they are for me as much because I, but a lot of the times I'm picking their brains and how do you handle different decisions as you go forward. I think that's what I look for in a president, someone I can connect with, communicate with. I didn't want to be a silo and I didn't want them to be a silo that once I got here, that communication stopped. And uh, for Dr. Esteban, I think the biggest thing was he was a texter from day one. <laughs> and I'd like that just constant communication just in the middle of the night. Hey, here's a note. It just kind of opened up to know he's relational. Uh, you know, him and Joe, his wife, um, hit it off with my wife, Allison, at dinner. At that point, that was just over a year ago, I think last, last week. Um, that's when I knew without a doubt I wanted to be here. My hope was he felt the same way. But without a doubt, at that dinner, that relationship, I enjoyed the conversation. You know, I had that, even at Kentucky, I had that relationship as a deputy, um, you know, with the president and his wife, um, you know, dealing with Dr. Eli Capilouto and his wife, Mary Lynn. Um, we still converse today. And so I understood what I was looking for. And when it fit that mold to have a conversation, to be able to have someone you can look up to, but also just talk about, hey, what's a good place to go grab, you know, sushi? You know, that you can have that kind of just regular conversation to regular people. That's that's what makes a place great. You can have regular people that can come together for a common goal. No matter all walks of life, other experiences, that's what athletics is trying to teach the world. You know, if we can get to a point where, you know, we've got a locker room full of young people that are from all over the U.S. and abroad. Uh, they've got different thoughts, and hobbies and majors and different goals for when they leave here. They can come together for a common goal and put everything aside. If we can learn more from our young people and how they do it every day, I think we'll be a lot better off. Yeah, exactly. Thinking about young people, thinking about uh, college athletics, all right? Name, image, and likeness. Student athletes are empowered to go out and learn how to be entrepreneurial to under, try to find out what their value is. There's problems with it. There's benefits to it. I wonder about um, you guys' thoughts on it. I know you included a big aspect of it into your strategic plan in terms of educating student athletes. I, I wonder if you guys have some kind of thoughts as this thing pretty much started when you started here, <laughs> right? Uh, as this thing kind of evolves, thoughts on uh, the empowered student athlete and when you were playing before you stopped playing or when I was a walk-on athlete, if I would have taken advantage of opportunities. Um, just any, any thoughts on that? We'll start with you, Dr. Frank. Well, one of the things that, first of all, I, I like the, our approach, you know, and Dwayne said, this is going to happen to us. Let's get ahead of it and let's make sure that we have some type of control so that we can, it can be a benefit to our students and that they're not going to, that we're going to really provide them the foundation where they're going to be in a position where they're going to benefit from it and it's not going to um, be a negative or it's not going to be, what I'm concerned about is if they have to go out and do it all on themselves, if they have to learn how to do all these things by themselves, it's just going to be one more thing in their extremely busy, challenging lives that might take away from their performance, might be take away from their academics, and might add a lot to their stress value and affect their mental health. So this is big. And it, it's probably... Um, a significant amount of what they think about, you know, as they're coming back to campus and, and how are they going to build that into their you know, like daily lives. So I'm concerned about that, but I'm actually less concerned now that I think that our approach is we're going to be proactive. We're going to provide them the platform where they're going to be able to take advantage of it in the right way. Right. I think um, the best thing for us here at DePaul is that just went back to relationships. And so we immediately started partnering with our campus. These are things that we probably could have done five years ago. And some of the processes had started in that way, uh, whether you were teaching, you know, our student athletes how to promote their brand or which was a better way than telling them not put bad things on social media. You're telling them how to use it to their advantage to build their brand. 
Um, so we started that process, but now partnerships with Dree House College of Business here, um, you know, the Coleman Entrepreneur Center, our communications uh, uh, college. Maybe those are things that we could have done before. Those are things that were already in place to some degree, but now everybody's paying attention more. There were several students that would have always took that challenge and I want to be better, but those are always, those are usually the students that already manage their time well. They do well academically and managing the stresses of everything going on, but everybody's not like that. So what we had to do is be educational. That's the one thing we can continue to do. We might can't help them uh, broker a deal, but everything around it, the education, how do you evaluate uh, a situation, uh, agents, um, the entrepreneur. I would. I love the fact that they're going to learn that while they're here now, because we were always kind of setting them up for success and just hope they could fly. Now they can test those things out here, and we still have them. Like so, if they mess up in the worst way, they still got an education. They still got people that care about them. They still have a, a process to get through the rough time. And I think I love the fact that our our people here. Uh, are really hesitant to just jump out there. They have something to protect. And that's what I've been proud of the most. We were talking about yesterday, uh, one of the student athletes came up with the idea. Uh, I said, you know, let's do business cards for all our student athletes. And they've never thought about it from that process. That's something we could have always done because when they meet people, what am I giving them? I don't necessarily want to give them my, my cell phone number. That's probably my instinct, right? But so now you might have something with my social media on it or um, you know, my, my email, just so if somebody wants to contact me. Now that's more of a business element versus just a, you know, a career fair or job fair, or, Hey, what I might meet somebody later when I'm done. That's a relationship that can start now. And so I think those are the things you'll see bigger shift of connecting people to more, uh, people in the business world or their field of study that they're used, they want to go into. Let's expand the educational experience. That's the way I'm looking at it. And my hope is because it's more tied to something they're interested in now, even more, then they'll learn even more. And then we'll feel better about what we deliver. You know, we're, you know, one of our guiding principles of developing and equipping our future leaders. What better way than this? Because now it takes away some of the barriers of the things that we could do. And there's a lot more buy-in from our student athletes. Yeah, it's an, it's an evolution of college athletics, an evolution of the student athlete experience. One thing I do wonder, especially because you guys have involved academics in the business center and those types mm -hmm. of things, some of the student athletes, their brand may be at its highest value in four or five or six years that they're on campus, and it may not be valued as much when they leave. What is the preparation for that? I mean, it's similar to preparing a student athlete for post sports, I guess, right? Is there an aspect of what you have developed that uh, prepares people for, you know, you, your value, why you're, why they, the attention is on you, make sure you are doing things right so that you can continue to be valued when you're not in the jersey anymore. I mean, is there an aspect to that? Because I know you know mm -hmm. how important that is. And I'm sure you know how important it is being involved. As, as well, there has to be a carryover from what they're learning during this you know, communication marketing and that, um, you know, negotiating contracts and looking, you know, protecting yourself, I think is going to be one of the biggest um, lessons. And how do you um, take that into business? How do you take that forward, you know, in whatever role you're going to be in after you leave here? So that's, I think, part of our, it's almost like part of our career process here preparation for career. I think that's why we intentionally started the Student Athlete Experience Committee with Annie was talking about earlier. Uh, I think the future of it, I like to have a Student Athlete Experience Division, and there might be different aspects of things that go in it. But we have a lot of parts to that right now. Uh, you know, at DePaul right now, we have a lot of people that are maybe doing things beyond what maybe their job description was four or five years ago, but now it's a part of what they do. And we tried, so I thought the best place for us now, let's bring all those people together. And part of our strategic plan is to be more intentional about where that goes. Let's figure out where our gaps are. You know, you know, and we might be bringing people from our AAA, which is our academic um, advising group. We might be bringing people that are doing more student development or leadership pieces, working with our SAC or our captain's council. 
um, our, our alumni affairs. Um, and so then and, and Annie and I both thinking big picture around it, what it affects. There's some really good conversations that have come out of that. One, we found out that we're really, we really do a good job of developing the student as a, as a, as a person, a player, um, you know, and, and not, you know, and, but got to pay attention to those things along with being that student. Right. So what they're as a freshman, what, what's their development as a sophomore? What, what do they look like as a junior, senior, that baseline that everybody gets? What can we add to it? Because if I'm out fundraising or talking to donors about things we're trying to add to that, it's good to know what we're doing and what the next steps can be. And I think that was the, the reason to bring those groups together, those minds, not just to, hey, let's talk about what we do and let's get a task for this week, but that brainstorming with people that really are in it every day with students brings about more change. You know, we talked about the athletics board earlier. That's why we shifted from what I called you, if you don't remember, it was, I, called, I said it was cupcakes and updates <laughs> before. Let's change it to really getting something out of this where it's not wasting your time and we'll continue to learn from each other. There might be missteps like, man, okay, I know next time it would be helpful. That's why you have a group that you vet with every day. So when you do mess up, they can criticize you and you know it's trying to make you better too. Mm-hmm. I need that. And I don't need that. I can't get that from my staff every day. Having an outside group that can be that, you know, they're trying to help us as much. They don't know how, how important that is. And so I'm glad that, you know, even though Annie won't be the chair going forward, she's still a part of that process because she has a unique perspective being on that over time. And I think that's what's going to help us going forward as well. All right. I'll ask you a couple of questions here and then we'll wrap. Um, first, in a hypothetical. I mean, there's probably a ton of hypotheticals. You can think about the name, image and likeness. But, you know, a student may, and I guess this is a part of the education process, get into a deal where, I f- they feel like I need to be playing more mm-hmm. because I have a deal with this company, right? On top of I need to be playing more because everybody back home thinks I should be playing more, right? And right. you know how that works. I wonder about those type of hypotheticals, right? Do you do you plan for those or do you discuss like how these things can go? I mean, that's probably a national discussion, right? Here's the things that could possibly happen when we start dealing with this this t- tough situation on the line of student athletes going out and you know finding out what their value is and companies telling them that you're worth this much to me, but I need you to make sure that you're, you know what I mean? Just right. Tell me about thoughts on just planning for the unthinkable. I mean, I'm always, what I've told our staff and what I'll continue to tell our student athletes is be the teammate you want to play with. Um, your brand, what you do between the lines is going to affect more than anything else. I mean, you're here for an academic experience. But the reason that you're in athletics is that you're providing, you're different. You're willing to do more. You're willing to put in that hard work, the the training, all that extra time to be a student athlete. So that performance is going to lead to some things. That's what makes you big. And it's also your team's performance. That's probably the biggest factor of raising that brand awareness. So don't get lost in yourself all of a sudden. This is not the time to, to worry about just you. Because if you can worry about and focus on every one of your teammates and everybody else is doing that, that's how your brand expands. If you're a national champion, you're a Big East champion, you're, doing, you're successful in your sport along with what we're doing individually in the classroom and in the community, those are the things that are going to make you a viable option. But it's a learning process to that because you maybe didn't learn that till later, but that's what you're going to do in the business world. That's what you're going to do if you're playing professional sports. Um, now you're learning that process now. I never really hesitated from the fact that people talking about basketball and football players all of a sudden in the locker room are going to have different deals and how much money. That's what we deal with equivalency sports every day. They're on different scholarships. They got different aid. They're both playing for more money. That's always been a factor and nobody's balked at that. So why we, why we sell these young people short that they can't adjust? What did they do during this pandemic? We had one of the best academic years we've ever had here because they could be challenged. We had track athletes set not just personal records, but school records with a limited training schedule. I just think that a lot of times we don't give 
this generation enough credit for what they're capable of. Maybe they didn't have as much adversity before this pandemic as some of these other generations had. And maybe we just haven't seen what they're capable of because they hadn't had that hurdle or that wall to climb. And now I'm willing to put my faith in them. I know the young people we bring into this program are fully capable of making great decisions and and moving forward to a better direction for their professional lives than before. And we got to help them along the way. We have a role for that. That's why we have jobs. Because there weren't any students. I don't know what we'd be doing. But if you really try to change a perspective where we can get in that same atmosphere where from staff, we worry about what everybody else is making and I need a bigger role and I need supervisor responsibilities and start worried about ourselves, we get in the same process, same bad habits. But if we really care about our department, our university, our school, and think about these students every day, it'll all work out. We didn't get where we are by trying to figure out how we can put somebody down to get up. You know, it's just working hard every day, having the right principles, having the goal sets and, and trying to, to accomplish those goals and exceed them, not just go to the line. That's how you get a chance to do something different. And that's what we got to teach to our young people. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think student athletes, not even before this generation, have always adjusted from the NCAA putting in new core GPAs and people up in arms about that and all of a sudden athletes adjust to what the GPA is and, and a number of things down the line sports in general. I wonder, Dr. Frank, as we wrap up here, your opinion on um, just preparing for the unknown in terms of what's coming in college athletics from an academics perspective as we wrap up the conversation. Well, first, I wanted to add a little bit to the name, image, and likeness question that you said. You know, So an athlete might want more playing time. Okay, well, playing time is not everything, but well, who's who's going to influence playing time? It's going to be that athlete. And are they going to get into the weight room more? Are they going to really be focused more? When they do get into the game, are they going to perform? You know, are they going to let the mental um, aspect of the game be a negative or a positive for them? You know, how are they going to improve their playing time? So, you know, we talked about the pros and cons of everything. It could, it, it could even be a benefit to some student athletes because they have this additional motivation. You know, I'm not a big fan of it, but it's here, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think from the educational perspective and moving forward, as an educator, I teach my students that every one of their students, and I'm a teacher educator, so my students are going to be teachers and some of them are going to work in the fitness industry and work with clients. Every single client, every single student is an individual and you have to understand their perspective and their needs, what they need at this particular time. And I think that um, we need to do that with our student athletes. And I think everybody needs to do that with whoever they're interacting with, you know, with diversity. Diversity is what makes that's wonderful and that we're learning from each other constantly. So just learning about each other, learning what is the person's priorities? Why are they here? You know, what do they need physically? What do they need emotionally, socially? What is every? And so I think that that's the thing that we can provide our students as role models um, to lead them in that direction. And I think that this generation, like you said, they're doing that. They are reaching out. Um, and they're, they're, they respect their peers on a different level, I think, because of the diversity that we, they are um, functioning in. And so I think that that's the biggest thing is individualizing the things that we do and th- the value that they're going to put on that, too, as well, when they interact and move into the prof- their professional life. Right, which is excellent. Um, I'll say this. My mother was a teacher, so I respect anybody who in, is involved with teaching at all. Because I think it's the most important and most under-respected Under-respected, yes, country, definitely. Right? Mm-hmm. This has been an excellent conversation. I really appreciate you guys here, having me here at DePaul. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. That was Dwayne Peavy. He is the Vice President and Director of Athletics here at DePaul, and Dr. Anna Marie Frank, who is the Faculty Athletics Rep and Associate Professor of Kinesiology also here at DePaul. And of course, I'm Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. And keep in mind, the role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today.